It's a city I thought I would never see again. But after five years, I am back. On the surface, Kabul hasn't changed much. Still a vibrant, bustling city. It smells and sounds assaulting your senses as soon as you step into the streets. But beneath it all, and despite the violence that still threatens, there's been a drastic sea change here and across the rest of Afghanistan. I have returned to a place that has both haunted and changed my life. When your life is altered, you're always gonna be connected to the place where it happened somehow. And so I do feel like a connection. Five years ago, I was at the Chahari Kambar refugee camp, filming a story on the growing refugee crisis during the height of Canada's military involvement here. As I was leaving the camp, I was taken hostage by a gang of armed men, stabbed and held captive in a hole underground for 28 days. I was released largely unscathed after Afghan authorities arrested the family of one of my kidnappers my freedom for his mother's. I felt a lot of guilt that I got to come home and I was okay. I got to come back to my family and my friends and my very comfortable life in Canada. Um, and the people who I'd gone to tell stories about, the refugees, were sort of overshadowed. Their story was overshadowed by mine. The images of the Afghans whose stories I'd gone there to tell, the refugees who couldn't go home, the little girls who couldn't go to school, they followed me everywhere. And this one is so precious. That's so mad. He would always sleep with his hand, hand on his head like that. Well, and look, and Luke, Luke, is, Luke is doing it too. <laughs> Ren Daw lives in Kingston, Ontario. All four of her sons served in Afghanistan. Matthew was the youngest. Graduation? That was his graduation with his dad, yeah. Meeting Ren is well, like it all coming full circle for me because my first trip to Afghanistan, my first assignment there in 2007, I covered one of the worst days of the war in Afghanistan for Canada. Um, an ID killed six Canadian soldiers and their translator. And one of those soldiers was Matthew Daw. Task Force Afghanistan, stand at eight. I don't know who killed Matt and I don't really, doesn't matter to me, but I know what killed him though. It's hatred and intolerance and ignorance. Well, what are you gonna do about it? Of course, uh, the military is gone and everything, but the need is still there. Education is the only way, really. To maintain the support in the I think community? It is. I yeah. think it will be. It, Daw it felt will a be. need we're to finish her son's done mission, done. so she started volunteering with the small group of women in Kingston after Matt died. Their mission, to make a difference for women and children in Afghanistan. To me, the potential is with the young people, the children and the women. We're so excited that we're actually going to meet the children at our school. Madeline Tarasik and her best friend Margaret Stewart, both educators, founded the Kingston chapter of Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan, an NGO with chapters across the country. This May, the two women finally decided that it was time to go see for themselves what their decade of fundraising had accomplished. I invited myself to go with them. I saw in their journey an opportunity to finish what I'd started. The House of Flowers Orphanage in the heart of Kabul is more than just home to 30 children. It's where they live, learn and play, their refuge from the war all made possible by the generosity of several non-governmental organizations, including Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. Care bearers. These are the most vulnerable of children, 
Many have seen a lifetime of trauma in their few short years. Some saw their parents gunned down right before their eyes. Others were simply abandoned. Faruza is 12 years old. Both of her parents died when she was eight. I remember when they died, she says, a motor bicycle accident. She likes math and English and wants to be a doctor when she grows up. And the RC everyone, and the RC everyone. As we drive away, Madeline and Mark can hardly contain themselves. They finish each other's sentences. It's funny when I felt, when I was there, I just felt like, wish we had more to give them. Yes. Like I wish we had why, why a ton of some of our... Uh, why can't we give them more? I'm madly in love with the place. <laughs> I got the bug. Lauren Oates understands. She's the young Canadian who oversees all of Women for Women's projects in Afghanistan. We're this close to lifting this country out of the rut that it's been in, the, the thunderstorm that it's been in for three decades, um, to, to make change irreversible. We're so close and we just need a little bit more time. There's a lot of progress. Let's not kid ourselves, right? You know, 10 years ago, there were under a million kids in school, and almost none of them were girls. And now, there's 10 million kids in school, and 40% are girls. That's a huge accomplishment for any country, let alone a country that's been in war for the last 10 years. The next stop for Mad and Marg, the Fatima Telzara School. The women come bearing gifts of badly needed school supplies for the children here. 280 young girls and boys who aspire to a future their parents could only dream of. You could be, maybe you could pass it. Yeah, yeah let's pass it around. What's, uh, what's your favorite subject in school? Mm -hmm. Math. Math? Mm -hmm. Is it math hard? Mm -hmm. No, it is easy, really easy. I love it because I want to become an engineer in the future. Does anyone want to tell what their plan is, what their dream is? She says, a doctor. Okay. I do think Afghan has to control the destiny of Afghanistan. However, I feel that that is a, a, an easy way for the rest of the world to opt out, because right now the kind of work we are doing it's genuine and it's giving them capacity and the tools to do that very thing. This is unique. Murawad Ziai is a Women for Women's Afghan Country Director, intimately involved in all of the projects the NGO sponsors. We are thirsty for education, we are mad for, for employment, um, to be depend independent, to be our, on our own. Um, these are the things that we desire for as, as a nation. And um, this can't be possible without, without like, a strong government. The day after we visited the school, a suicide bomb exploded nearby, killing 12 and injuring dozens more. One of the biggest challenges for Lauren Oates. Yeah, it makes the, the work harder, and it makes it harder for Canadians to buy into when they're seeing the news back home about all the violence. It's, it's a huge struggle to try to keep the other side of things um, alive in the minds of Canadians to, to keep bringing back that message that there's change happening here. It's so important. We're so close. This is our last chance. Okay, you're going to fire two five-round bursts. You'll fire your first five It's a critical rounds. moment. After more than 10 years of war, U.S. and NATO troops and the last contingent of Canadian Forces trainers are set to leave in 2014. There is real fear that the progress made in education and women's rights will be lost. There were promises made to the Afghans. The international community, including Canada, said, we will be there with you. We'll be there until there's peace. We will stand by you to rebuild your country, to rebuild the education sector. We care about the education of girls. We care about what happened to women under the Taliban. So those promises were made. Afghans heard them. 
And Afghans can also smell betrayal a long way off because they've been betrayed before. Neither the Afghans nor their friends have any idea what they want to do after 2014. This one, my love. Nancy Hatch Dupree is affectionately known as the grandmother of Afghanistan, a title she earned after making this country her home for half a century. Dupree is the founder and force behind the Afghan Center at Kabul University, the most complete library dedicated to Afghan history and culture. It's the only place where scholars in Afghanistan can learn about their own country. Why is this building so important to you? To me, because I fell in love here, and uh, I was married here, and I had a very, very happy time here. So now the Afghans have been facing difficulties for some time, and uh, I feel if there's anything I can do to help, um, I should not abandon them. I should stay here. She's seen this country at its best and its worst, but her faith in Afghanistan's future remains steadfast. When I'm coming to the office, I can hardly get through the streets because there are so many girls going into the schools. It's wonderful. And I think if the Taliban should come back to try and close those girls' schools now, unlike they did in 1996. I don't think they could do it now because the women are out there. 19-year-old Husnia is studying computer science, hoping to attend university to further her studies. She's the eldest of five children and the first person in her family to attend college. But money is scarce. Uh, my father is a, um, a student in a shop of uh, tire, uh, in a shop of uh, his anchor. And my mother works in an office as a cleaner. And it really upset me because they really do um, hard work for me. But our community in Kingston wanted to raise some money to help support some young women here in Afghanistan to carry on their studies. The Canadian NGO has chosen to put Husnia through school for the next four years with a scholarship. Thank you so much. You're I'm very so welcome. Yeah. You're very welcome. You can't get an, a girl to unlearn how to write her own name. So I'm as committed as ever and, and as, as sure as, as any time ever that, that our work is important, and regardless of whether troops are there or not, we'll carry on. You don't heal, you get used to the army, you get a big scar. You feel a bit like an amputee, you know? You get used to live with it, but your arm is always gone, Lorna, you know? So that's what it is uh, with Matt. For Ren Daw and her husband, Peter, the work the NGO is doing in Afghanistan helps them stay connected to the son they lost there. Because we have been there, we have to finish. We have to continue. And it doesn't mean troops anymore, fine, but there are other ways. We have to educate women, children particularly, to, say, to, to complete that circle. Otherwise, it is a bit of a waste. It's hard because as a journalist, you're taught you have to be objective, but you know, it's hard to be objective because the girl's rights to education is, is a universal human right, right? There's no, there's no, you know, objectivity there. Girls deserve to go to school. And I just see thousands and thousands of girls that we've helped educate fanning out around the country and you know, doing anything from becoming a midwife in their community to maybe running for president someday. We have families, we have uh, children, we have 
parents and we care about them. We want them to get education, to work and have a, a normal life. A normal life is the right of every human being. Melissa Fung, CBC News, Kabul.